Lieutenant Koto Katoa. Good evening, everybody. My name is Melanie Thornton. I'm the Executive Director of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to you all, um, including some members of the diplomatic community who are with us here tonight. Um, it's great to start the year with a fascinating topic such as nuclear weapons, and, um, and that topic's been on the global agenda for many decades, as well as part of the New Zealand psyche for a long time. As Kiwis, we signed petitions by the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Some of us sailed to disrupt the French testing at Mururoa. And many more of us created our own nuclear-free zones across private properties, churches, and marae. We've been involved in this for many decades. Tonight, we're going to hear from three different speakers on different aspects of the treaty and on New Zealand's role as a country advocating for a nuclear-free weapons approach across the globe. There's going to be time for questions at the end, so please save those questions for then. So I'm just going to introduce the speakers, and then um, they will speak one after the other um, over the next um, hour. Professor David Capey is our first speaker, and he's the director of the Centre for Strategic Studies and a professor in international relations at Victoria University of Wellington. His research interests focus on conflict and security issues, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region and New Zealand's foreign and defence policy. He's currently regional co-chair of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific and was a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum Experts and Eminent Persons Group from 2012 to 2019. Angela Woodward is Deputy Executive Director of VERTIC, uh, which stands for the Verification, Research, Training and Information Centre, which is based in the UK. She's also a member of the Asia-Pacific Leadership Network on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament and a council member at the Disarmament and Security Centre New Zealand. She previously served on New Zealand's Public Advisory Committee on Disarmament and Arms Control and was an adjunct senior fellow at the School of Law, University of, of Canterbury. Angela was previously an advisor to the chair of the UN Group of Governmental Experts on verification in all its aspects in 2006, and she's taught public international law and international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science and at the University of Canterbury. And last but not least is Sarah Samarian, a PhD candidate and tutor at the Centre for Defence and Security Studies at Massey University in Palmerston North. He's an analyst who's worked in government, research, think tank, and tertiary education sectors with experience at both national and international levels, and he's also the chair of the <coughs> Institute's Palmerston North branch. So um, first off, um, Professor Capey, if you would like to speak about New Zealand's role. Nami uh, Nui Kia Koto, everyone. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to the NZIAA for the invitation to be part of uh, this panel discussion this evening. Uh, and also, thank you to you for coming along. I have to say, you, I'm, I can only assume there's people here who are sort of allergic to direct sunlight uh, or, or have uh, uh, lonely social lives, given what a beautiful evening it is out there in Wellington. But uh, uh, maybe it's just something that um, uh, those who are, are devoted to this cause are even more devoted than most people. It's lovely. Thank you very much for coming along. And can I also extend my congratulations to those people in the room who have worked uh, and uh, so hard on the last few years to advance the cause uh, of the treaty that we're going to be talking about this evening. Now, Melanie asked me to talk about New Zealand's anti-nuclear history and its significance, and I guess I'll try and provide a little bit of background and context before handing over to the real experts who are here this evening, Angela and, and Cyrus. And I thought that I would really focus on three things. One, I talk about the origins and development of New Zealand's anti-nuclear sentiment. Um, secondly, some themes which hopefully will provide a sort of organising framework for New Zealand's uh, uh, anti-nuclear and disarmament diplomacy uh, on the global stage. And then finally, as we celebrate or mark the, um, the, the entry into force of the TPNW, to identify just a few current challenges that will require new commitment in the years ahead. 
Uh, it wouldn't be a, a somebody from the direct from the Centre for Strategic Studies if there wasn't a slightly pessimistic note to finish on. Um, but two minor points before I begin. First of all, I have to say I'm very sorry that my wife tells me I can't pronounce the word nuclear to save my life, uh, and that I like to say nuclear instead of nuclear, uh, in, much in the way like a Channel Slim Pickens or George W. Bush. So for that, I apologise in advance. And secondly, I've set myself a personal challenge this evening of trying to get through this talk without uh, using the phrase that we punch above our weight. Uh, that might require even more of a challenge, so wish me luck. <clears throat> so first of all, to the history. And I think New Zealanders' antipathy to nuclear weapons can be traced back to the early Cold War, uh, while the use of atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki was generally welcomed by a war-weary public at the time, it was testing of nuclear weapons in the Pacific, and in particular thermonuclear weapons, that began to provoke opposition from a wide, from a wide swathe of New Zealand society. And in his memoir, David Longy remembered that one test uh, turned the sky blood red Red over Auckland, leaving, with, leaving him with what he called a chill sense of dread. And I remember as a young, well, reasonably young student uh, here, uh, an, an undergrad, Rod Alley, telling me in the audience tonight, telling me a very similar story about the way that uh, those nuclear tests in the Pacific changed the atmosphere of New Zealand and really had a tangible effect. And there was one test in particular, the 15 megaton um, Castle Bravo test, which destroyed Bikini Atoll and ended up contaminating a Japanese fishing vessel in 1954, which sparked particular public outrage and, and reawakened a, uh, awakened a sense of consciousness about nuclear and radioactive fallout. And as um, the former New Zealand diplomat and uh, historian, the late Malcolm Templeton, talks about in his magisterial book, Standing Up Right Here, New Zealand in the Nuclear Age, uh, he says there was a, that that was a test that set off a dramatic uh, increase in the in the correspondence that new ordinary New Zealanders, uh, organisations, and private citizens started writing to the Prime Minister. And the, 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 this outrage, this sense of opposition, came from a broad swathe of New Zealand society. It wasn't a radical fringe; it was churches, trade unions, uh, political party branches, individuals, all writing letters or signing petitions calling for a ban on nuclear testing and on the, uh, the H-bomb itself. Now, if there was a sort of a, uh, a modest but steadily growing opposition to American and British nuclear testing, antipathy uh, intensified in the early 1960s when France indicated it would relocate its testing program from the Sahara Desert to Polynesia. Uh, there was a, uh, at the time, uh, MFAT instru instructed its diplomats in Paris that it should tell the French it was opposed, to, uh, New Zealanders would be more opposed to French testing than they were to British and American testing because it was, quote, less important to Western security. Uh, lucky diplomat that would have been asked to pass on that message. Um, and in August 1963, some 80,000 New Zealanders signed a petition asking the New Zealand government to take the necessary steps to, quote, ban the bomb south of the line and keep the southern hemisphere free of nuclear arms. Now, a key driver of these early concerns about nuclear weapons were, were the f uh, health and environmental consequences of testing. Um, concerns about pollution from French atmospheric testing and more raw led to pu uh, public anger when higher than normal levels of strontium-90 were found in milk in Samoa and in New Zealand in the late 1960s. And by the early 1970s, a thriving environmental movement, groups like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, had adopted the issue. In 1971, the National Party government told the, the United States it wouldn't accept visits by nuclear-powered ships until Washington uh, agreed to accept liability uh, for uh, in the event of a nuclear accident. And a further symbol, I think, of the growing public concern about the risks of all things nuclear came in 1976 when a petition presented under the banner of the Coalition for Non-Nuclear Futures was signed by a pretty staggering 333,000 people. Now, if concerns about health and environmental risks were uh, posed by testing and energy were uh, dominated the early years of New Zealand's anti-nuclear movement, fears of nuclear war uh, between the major powers began to play a much greater role as the Cold War went on. And in the early 1950s, the first New Zealand branches of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament were formed, inspired by their British counterparts, and the CND grew dramatically in the early 60s in New Zealand, focused on the goal of a 
Southern Hemisphere nuclear free zone. The conflict in Vietnam mobilized opposition to war and nuclear weapons, including many in New Zealand that will go on to hold positions of power uh, in the fourth Labour government. And the uh, end of uh, uh, detente and the new Cold War of the early 1980s created new fears. The deployment of uh, new weapons, uh, new systems such as MIRV and MX, uh, and new strategies such as uh, counterforce and the idea of fighting limited nuclear war uh, all provoked uh, greater concerns. And this didn't always seem distant from the Pacific, as well as testing. Uh, Washington, for example, had plans to test fire its MX missile with a splashdown in the Tasman Sea. And this convergence of health, environmental, and strategic concerns prompted what Kennedy Graham has called a metamorphosis in New Zealand's threat perceptions, a country that for most of its history had sought protection from a great and powerful state increasingly asked itself whether or not an alliance with the United States brought greater risks uh, than rewards. And in 1986, a uh, Defence Committee of Inquiry um, established by the government carrying out a survey, uh, asked New Zealanders what they considered as the gr their greatest present worry. Nuclear war was identified by 48% of respondents as the greatest threat to New Zealand, compared with just 11% who feared an armed invasion. That th shift in threat perceptions, that shift in New Zealand's sense of, of themselves and their place in the world, found its moment in the fourth Labour government, the ANZUS crisis, and the 1987 New Zealand Nuclear Free Zone uh, Disarmament and Arms Control Act. And I won't go into all of the ins and outs of how that nuclear free policy turned into law. It's been well covered elsewhere. But I think since 1990, this has been, with maybe a brief uh, glitch between 2003 and 2005, this is legislation that has attracted bipartisan um, political support, widespread public support. Now, as well as laying out the various rules and laws around uh, for uh, prohibitions on nuclear weapons and nuclear power within New Zealand, that 1987 Act sought to, quote, promote and encourage an active and effective contribution by New Zealand to the essential process of disarmament and ar international arms control. So what's that contribution look like? And turning to the international diplomacy, I thought I'd just draw out four, what I think are four themes of some of New Zealand's uh, nuclear disarmament uh, over the last few decades, leading up to the treaty, which I, I know Angelo is going to talk more about next. Now, small states are, of course, typically thought of as strong supporters of international law and international institutions, so it's no surprise that a really important area where New Zealand has made a contribution, and I think a significant contribution, has been in the development and support for legal measures uh, against nuclear weapons. New Zealand and Australia took France, of course, to the International Court of Justice in May 1973 to force a halt to atmospheric testing at Mooroa. New Zealand has been a strong supporter and voice for measures such as the CTBT, along with Australia, sadly yet to uh, come into force, and for states to honour the 1970 Non-Proliferation Treaty, including for nuclear weapon states to implement their obligations to disarm under Article 6 of the NPT. But maybe most relevant to today's discussions, New Zealand has been an enthusiastic and active participant in efforts to reframe nuclear weapons not as a means to achieve national security for states, but rather as a threat to human security through the humanitarian initiative that has gathered momentum over the last decade. And the TPNW that we're focused on here this evening, in some respects, had its origins with the World Court Project, started by the retired District Court Judge Harold Evans in Christchurch uh, in 1986, seeking a ruling on the legality of nuclear weapons. Now, through the efforts of various NGOs and campaigners, this this idea found its way to the UNGA, where in 1994 New Zealand was, the, I think, the only Western state to vote in favour of asking the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on the legality of nuclear weapons. And when that op opinion appeared in 1996, it said that the, quote, the threat or use of nuclear weapons would generally be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict, and in particular, the principles and rules of humanitarian law. 
And I think it's this humanitarian turn this has, was a vital one in the campaign against nuclear weapons. And over the last decade, a key focus for New Zealand's nuclear diplomacy has been its leadership within the humanitarian initiative. At the 2012 meeting of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, New Zealand warned uh, of the, quote, immense humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and said, quote, all states must, must intensify their efforts to outlaw nuclear weapons uh, and to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. And one recent analysis by Kate Hughes and Lyndon Burford describes New Zealand as the public face of the humanitarian initiative, coordinating and presenting joint statements on behalf of an increasing number of, of states, statements that eventually attracted support from 159 different countries. And this carried over into negotiations for a, treat, a ban treaty where New Zealand served as the vice president of the UN conference, something I think that Angela will talk about more, more shortly. A second important theme of our uh, disarmament diplomacy has been a, a focus on the Pacific. And I've already mentioned the World Court case in the 1970s. We can uh, remember the dispatch of the frigate uh, Otago, Otago to Mura, the actions of the Bolger government in the 1990s. But one of the first distinct measures that New Zealand governments put forward to reflect their opposition to nuclear weapons testing was the idea of a South Pacific nuclear weapons free zone. These zones were anticipated in Article 7 of the NPT, uh, and the idea was first raised by New Zealand in 1975. It's picked up again by Australia in 1983, and after much debate, the Treaty of Rarotonga was adopted in 1985, just the second nuclear-free zone in, the, in, a, in a populated part of the world. Today, there are five such zones in place, and I think it would be churlish to say that the Treaty of Rarotonga didn't play any part as an inspiration for those others. Now, even if not an awful lot has happened with spin fizz since 1986, I think these zones retain a symbolic value and salience together. And it was interesting that with the 35th anniversary of the treaty last year, that it was also marked by the first meeting of, state, of states' parties in, where New Zealand was also a participant. And beyond the Treaty of Rarotonga, I think the Pacific is an increasingly important participant in global disarmament dip diplomacy, articulating concerns about issues like providing victim assistance and environmental remediation, some of the positive obligations uh, that are in the Nuclear Ban Treaty. And New Zealand has worked closely with Pacific states uh, on both nuclear and conventional arms control, including issuing the 2018 Auckland Statement on the Treaty uh, Prohibiting Nuclear Weapons. Third, uh, I think New, New Zealand's nuclear diplomacy has been, and this might not be a surprise to many people in this room, by a close partnership with civil society. As I mentioned, uh, New Zealand's anti-nuclear sentiment was shaped in important ways by the UK and European peace movements, but also by the Pacific and the Global South. And my former colleague here at Victoria, but Victoria Robbie Shilliam, has written about the, the role of the connections between Maori activists and those in the nuclear-free and independent Pacific movement that saw nuclear testing in the Pacific not just as an environmental and a security threat, but also as a colonial uh, imposition. And I think civil society has been central to all of the successes in humanitarian disarmament of the last few decades, in particular around landmines, around small arms and cluster munitions, and of course with the Nuclear Ban Treaty, the role of ICANN in winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Uh, and I think that in the case of the TPNW, uh, civil society helped provide ballast for states like New Zealand that might have otherwise found themselves uh, offside and somewhat distant from some of their traditional partners. Now, that's not to say that uh, New Zealand government and NGOs have always been perfectly aligned on these sorts of issues. I think there has been at times creative tensions, if you like. NGOs have wanted more, have wanted things to be done faster, language to be blunter, but perhaps uh, that's really how it should be. Fourth and finally, at a time in which we hear, about, we hear more and more about lining up with our Five Eyes partners, 
Uh, New Zealand's disarmament diplomacy is a reminder that we can also collaborate with a diverse range of states in our international diplomacy. And those arms control and disarmament coalitions include uh, members that might sometimes surprise. For example, New Zealand has been a member of the New Agenda Coalition, promoting nuclear disarmament alongside Brazil, Egypt, Ireland, Mexico and South Africa. And in successive NTP review conferences, uh, the NAC has pu pu pushed hard for those for nuclear weapon states to comply with their obligations under Article 6 of the NPT. On de-alerting, the idea that we should be moving away from having nuclear weapons on a hair trigger, uh, alerts where there's a real risk of accidental or unintended launch, and even greater risk in a, uh, in, in a cyber age. New Zealand has worked with Chile, Malaysia, Nigeria, Sweden, and Switzerland, calling for practical measures to decrease operational readiness of nuclear weapons. And I think it's just a reminder, I don't want to overstate that, that it reminds me a bit of uh, the, the, some of the partners that New Zealand worked with on another really important international instrument where we were uh, dis perhaps disproportionately influential, the law of the sea, where we also w worked uh, closely with a hot, really diverse range uh, uh, of states. Uh, and it's a reminder, I think, that the rules-based order can be built and sustained by a broad constituency of countries. So we're here today to celebrate the treaty, but I, I, I'd like to close by just noting a few challenges that are ahead. And actually here I think, and maybe it's just putting my strategic studies hat on, I think that the challenge is, the picture is, is, in, is, is pretty sobering. For all the progress on norm building, uh, the nuclear club has of course increased uh, since the conclusion of New Zealand's nuclear free legislation in 1987. We know that insecurity only leads to further armament and that proliferation begets proliferation. And here in our region, I think the risks are perhaps greater or as great as anywhere else in the world. If North Korea, for example, can put an ICBM on Washington, what does that say to Tokyo about the credibility of US extended deterrence? If Tokyo goes nuclear, what does that say to decision makers in South Korea? And we could ask, of course, the same uh, about um, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. And I would remind people that there was also, even closer to home, there was also a lively debate amongst Australian think tank, uh, think tankers and think, think, influential think tank participants uh, in the last 18 months or so about whether or not Australia needed to start thinking ahead about the possibility of a nuclear capability. There are also worrying developments among the existing nuclear weapons powers. Although there were deep cuts at the end of the Cold War, there's been very little uh, in development since. They've continued to modernize their weapons, including exploring low yield, more usable weapons. New doctrines of use are being considered, and states that have had comparatively small arsenals historically, such as China, are now looking to increase them. Finally, I think there's also challenges ahead in disarmament diplomacy. Now, the Biden administration in its, what, 10 days, 12 days in office has happily de de delivered us some good news of the extension with Russia of the New START agreement. But this year, um, we will see uh, the delayed review conference of the MPT, uh, probably in August, and the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW. And I think an interesting question will be, what will be the relationship between the MPT, which of course creates a category of states entitled to possess nuclear weapons, even while imposing on them an obligation dis to disarm, and the nuclear ban treaty? How do we avoid eroding the MPT while also working towards a goal uh, of a world free from nuclear weapons. Now, happily, New Zealand is already involved um, with other countries in the Stockholm Initiative, Stockholm 16, looking for pragmatic ways to try and uh, advance disarmament and, and to build bridges between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And a meeting in Berlin last year identified a number of stepping stones and measures that could identify these aims, including promoting transparency, restraint around fissile material production, and improved verification. But I think it would be fair to say, and maybe Angela will pick up on this, there's still there's perhaps some tensions between advocates of the TPNW uh, and, and advocates of that agenda. Thank you.
So to close, uh, one of the questions uh, Melanie posed to me was how significant has New Zealand's contribution been? Writing in 2006, Malcolm Templeton said, the nuclear-free policy and its consequences constitute perhaps the most significant development in New Zealand's international relations during the 20th century. Viewed in a global context, however, the significance of that policy is not great. Other non-nuclear states did not wish to take a comparable stand. He went on, the fact that the example set by New Zealand's anti-nuclear policy has not been followed by other governments in a comparable relationship with the United States must disappoint its most ardent advocates. It has had no visible impact on the global problem of nuclear armaments. Unquote. Now, perhaps when we look at the number of nuclear weapon states in the world and develops, developments in weapons technologies that I mentioned before, maybe that's not an unreasonable conclusion. But norm advocates might also say that they play the long game. Theirs is an effort to change the way we think about nuclear weapons, about creating stigma, about increasing the reputational costs around their possession and use. And I remember when I was a student in these very classrooms in the 1990s, thinking that friends who were ad activists and advocates campaigning against anti-personnel landmines, I thought that they were pursuing a futile cause, and they proved me wrong. And I only hope that proponents of a world free of nuclear weapons are equally successful. Whatever happens, I think that any fair observer would have to conclude that working with others New Zealand has been an important voice in moving that agenda forward and has punched above its weight. Thanks. <laughs>
So the push for the treaty came about due to the growing frustration by a large number of states, the non-nuclear weapon states, at the lack of progress on nuclear arms control in recent years, came about due to the frustration at the dressing up of nuclear arms control as nuclear disarmament by certain nuclear arms states, them being the, the recognised nuclear weapon states under the NPT, the UN Permanent Five, and the frustration at the abject failure of the NPT nuclear weapon states to make meaningful progress on their obligations under Article 6 of the NPT to pursue in good faith negotiations on effective measures relating to nuclear disarmament. So what was happening in the nuclear arms control regime? Well, we look first to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, the cornerstone of global nuclear non-proliferation efforts. It has its three pillars on non-proliferation, peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and disarmament. But there was this growing sense of frustration and about the deadlock between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states on achieving the third pillar of the treaty, disarmament. At the 2015 review conference, states parties failed to reach a consensus on a, fail, on a final report due to substantial gaps uh, on effective measures towards nuclear disarmament, uh, failure to agree on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons use, on uh, nuclear weapon states reporting under the treaty, there was insufficient transparency, uh, there was lack of agreement on the time frame and the process on convening a Middle East uh, WMD free zone uh, conference uh, that had been agreed at the 1995 Review and Extension Conference. It was the grand bargain that got the treaty extended in the first place. And efforts since uh, 2010 to convene that meeting had not been able to be held. Uh, the 2010 Review Conference had also, um, for the first time, included language on the catastrophic consequences of any use of nuclear weapons, but again, no meaningful progress had been made on um, operationalising uh, disarmament uh, comprehensively since then. There had been some positive developments in the conference, as I mentioned, the 20, after the 2015 review conference. We had the joint comprehensive plan of action agreed by the, the P5 plus Germany and Iran, this is the Iran nuclear deal, agreed in October 2015, uh, to control Iran's uranium enrichment activities under its nuclear energy program and to reduce the ability for it to break out with a nuclear weapons program. But we also saw uh, certain negative developments uh, since the 2010 review conference of the NPT. We saw the uh, US President Trump announce withdrawal of, from the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which banned certain land-based missile systems uh, with a range under 5,500 kilometres. We saw uh, the US President Trump withdrawal from the 2010 New START Treaty, which limited uh, the number of strategic warheads that could be deployed to 1,550. We saw US President Trump's, uh, Trump's announced withdrawal from the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And uh, just this morning, we hear the news that Iran intends to uh, enrich uranium back up to 20%. Um, and we'll hear more about that from, from Cyrus later. And we also saw US President Trump's withdrawal from the 1992 Open Skies Treaty, uh, which was an important uh, treaty allowing overflight reconnaissance of military forces and activities, a really important confidence building measure among the state's parties. We've since heard that President Putin has uh, said that Russia will also withdraw, and there are another 32 <coughs> states uh, parties to that treaty in Europe. So with that backdrop, uh, the non-nuclear weapon states who are actually keen on disarmament decided to take action. They wanted to reshape the debate about nuclear weapons from a purely security issue to a humanitarian issue. Nuclear weapons, as David described, were then brought into the fold of humanitarian disarmament diplomacy and law, just as anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions were in the 1990s and early 2000s, when efforts to ban those weapons under the umbrella Conventional Arms Treaty failed due to obstructionist uh, states. Um, so powerful civil society groups that have worked on those campaigns, on landmines and cluster munitions, uh, turned their attention to nuclear weapons alongside um, the, the campaign, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which was established in Australia in 2007. And they worked in cooperation with a core group of TPNW negotiating states, Austria, Brazil, Ireland, Mexico, New Zealand, and South Africa, to lobby for a negotiating mandate for a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. They worked to change the discourse. 
um, to focus on the humanitarian impact. And this started with uh, the Humanitarian Initiative, a grouping within the MPT of 159 states that joined a statement, uh, that signed a joint statement in 2015 on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Then we had the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons Conferences, uh, which uh, were held in Austria and uh, Mexico and Vienna, Austria, uh, during 2013 to 14, and that led to a, a humanitarian pledge uh, to fill the legal gap in the MPT, because the MPT, of course, just prohibits the proliferation of nuclear weapons. It doesn't ban them outright. So that was an important step. Uh, the treaty itself, the TPNW, was negotiated uh, over two sessions at the UN in New York during 2017. And after its adoption, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. And as we've said, the treaty reached its 50th uh, ratification back in October last year, which triggered entry into force um, earlier this year. So great news. So the treaty itself, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, what does it do? Well, the treaty explicitly and unequivocally prohibits the use of nuclear weapons. It is legal recognition that any use of nuclear weapons is unacceptable from a moral, humanitarian and legal perspective and makes it illegal under international humanitarian law, the laws of armed conflict. As the International Committee of the Red Cross, which had actually had delegates on the ground in Hiroshima after it had suffered a nuclear attack, as the ICRC notes, no state or international organisation can appropriately respond to the humanitarian needs arising from the use of nuclear weapons, and so they must never be used. If we can't effectively respond to their use, we must prevent their use, and this treaty does that. And it's surprising that it's only now in 2021 that we have seen a treaty enter into force that is the first instrument of international law to help mitigate the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of the use and testing of nuclear weapons. So why is the treaty so important? Well, it's generating a norm that any use of nuclear weapons is unacceptable regardless of any rationale for its use, even in the, the um, absolute defense of the state. It requires states to take and justify their position on nuclear weapons, on these inhumane weapons. And nuclear weapons endorsing states that are under uh, extended deterrence uh, alliances um, are really going to have to work hard to um, show their support for disarmament um, uh, and, and ideally join the treaty. They sort of sit between this claim that disarmament is important and yet they won't join the TPNW. So now more about what the treaty does. Um, the treaty specifies positive obligations, which are things that states, parties must do, and negative obligations, things that they must not do. Uh, starting with the prohibitions or the negative obligations, states that join the treaty must not use nuclear weapons, they must not threaten to use nuclear weapons, so deterrence is prohibited. They must not develop or test nuclear weapons. They must not produce, manufacture, or otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons or any other nuclear explosive device. And they must not assist, encourage, or induce anyone in any way to engage in any activity that is prohibited under the treaty. There are also explicit prohibitions on transferring or receiving nuclear weapons, or allowing nuclear weapons to be stationed or deployed in states' parties' territory for the avoidance of any doubt about the extent of the already stated prohibitions on acquiring nuclear weapons. States are not permitted to register any reservations to the treaty, which could uh, purport to limit the application of the treaty's prohibitions on them. To do so would, of course, seriously undermine the object and purpose of the treaty, and so these are not permitted. Then there are the positive obligations. Uh, David has already mentioned them, the victim assistance and environmental remediation uh, obligations. States that join the treaty must provide assistance to anyone in their jurisdiction who is affected by nuclear weapons testing or use, including by providing medical care, rehabilitation and psychological support. And again, this is very much a carryover um, concept from the humanitarian disarmament treaties of, uh, relating to anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions, uh, where there are many um, survivors of those weapons who are requiring uh, uh, physical and medical care and economic rehabilitation following their injuries. The treaty also has these provisions on environmental remediation. States parties must carry out environmental remediation of areas under their jurisdictional control that have been contaminated by nuclear weapons testing or use, and this is a challenge for some states in the Pacific. 
States must also submit a report to the UN Secretary General on their involvement with nuclear weapons to date, whether they have ever owned, possessed or controlled nuclear weapons, and if so, whether they have eliminated their nuclear weapons program before joining the treaty. Uh, the first of these reports uh, is due uh, by 21st of February, uh, being 30 days after the treaty entered into force, and we can expect that New, New Zealand's report uh, should be pretty simple to complete. States must also adopt any necessary national laws to give effect to the treaty. Uh, and they must take action to encourage other states to join the treaty. And New Zealand has been um, active in this regard, working with our Pacific partners to encourage them to join, and many have done so to date. Uh, so the treaty is not only open to states that have never touched a nuclear weapon. Nuclear armed states are welcomed, indeed strongly encouraged, to join the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, they can choose either to eliminate their nuclear weapons program before joining, and go through a verification process to determine that they have actually irreversibly eliminated their nuclear weapons, or they can join the treaty and destroy their nuclear weapons as soon as possible, and no later than a deadline to be set by states' parties through a meeting of states' parties or review conference. Uh, this deadline will form part of a time-bound plan to verify the irreversible elimination of such a state's nuclear weapons program. Now, verification provisions in treaties are often the most difficult to negotiate and agree, and are sometimes left to be fleshed out in detail by subsequent arrangements. And this is the situation with the Nuclear Ban Treaty, not least because the states that negotiated it uh, don't have the full scope of expertise necessary to design such a system, not having ever developed nuclear weapons in the first place, apart from South Africa, but they got rid of theirs. Uh, and in the interest of getting the treaty uh, agreed smartly, while there was significant uh, momentum to get it finalised, there was a reluctance to let the negotiations stagnate or even fail by allowing years of debate on craft in the verification system, as happened with the Biological Weapons Convention uh, verification protocol negotiations during the 1990s. That was a crushing, crushing defeat when those uh, negotiations uh, ended. So instead, the banned treaty states parties opted to draw on existing verification measures involving the International Atomic Energy Agency to verify that nuclear material is not diverted from peaceful uses to a nuclear weapons program. So states must um, uh, agree a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the IAEA. Uh, and they opted to leave the elaboration and establishment of a nuclear verification disarmament agency uh, to negotiate and verify the irreversible elimination of any state's party's nuclear weapons program uh, to a later date. Um, this was a suitable solution under the circumstances, but it certainly leaves uh, a lot more work to be done, uh, not least on training non-nuclear weapon states on nuclear disarmament verification so that they can have trust in the outcome of such a verification process. And uh, such training and education is a job that I'm proud to say my organisation, Vertic, has been working on with states since 2007 when we got the UK and Norway together to work on uh, an initiative on uh, verification measures for nuclear disarmament. Very exciting. Uh, so, what is the current status of the treaty? Well, the Nuclear Ban Monitor Project has analysed states' positions on the treaty as follows. There are 52, currently 52 states' parties, soon to be 53 when the Philippines deposits its instrument of ratification. There are 36 states that have signed but not yet ratified the treaty, and a further 50 states that have demonstrated support for the treaty, such as by voting in favour of adopting the treaty at the United Nations in 2017, or by voting in, uh, in support of UN General Assembly resolutions on the treaty, uh, not least last year. Now, collectively, these states account for 70% of all states, not an insignificant number. There are 42 states who have consistently opposed the treaty, and these are the nuclear armed states, so the, the uh, nuclear weapon states under the NPT, plus India, Pakistan, um, um, Israel, and North Korea, uh, as well as those states that are under uh, extended deterrence and nuclear umbrella situations like the NATO allies. There are a further 17 states that are considered to be undecided on their position on the treaty. They have either abstained or absent during the UN votes on the treaty. Now, notably, most of these states have already have nuclear weapons-free security policies, so we could hopefully expect that they would consider joining the treaty in the future. At the regional level, support has been positive in all regions except Europe, uh, home to many of the NATO countries, of course, where 65% of, of states actively oppose the treaty, followed by Asia with 15% of states opposed. Uh, 
we might wonder at what rate have states joined the nuclear ban treaty compared to the other key weapons of mass destruction treaties. Well, as of 20th of December last year, which was three years and three months after the treaty's adoption, on average, the rate has been about the same as for the other key treaties. At that point, the TPNW had 51 states parties, the NPT had 66, Biological Weapons Convention 55, Chemical Weapons Convention 49, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty 51 states parties. So there is um, some momentum uh, on universality, on getting states to join the treaty. And it's interesting that COVID-19 um, has impacted states' ability to deposit their instruments of ratification or accession with the treaty's depository, being the UN Secretary General in New York, uh, due to access restrictions at the UN headquarters in New York. So in fact, the number um, could be be expected to be uh, going up soon. So um, let's see, skip that part. What are some of the criticisms that have been made of this fantastic treaty? Well, needless to say, the nuclear armed states remain rather fond of their nuclear weapons and are prepared to continue to defend and maintain these weapons and to criticise the treaty. Arguments have been made that nuclear weapons deter war, they defend us, we need them for strategic stability. And yet, there's really no evidence to prove a correlation between the existence of nuclear weapons and the absence of a major war between nuclear powers. In fact, UK's nuclear weapons did not deter Argentina from invading the Falkland Islands in 1982, for example, and US nuclear weapons did not deter the 2001 terrorist attacks or asymmetric warfare. In fact, if nuclear weapons did deter war, why aren't they encouraging other states to acquire them? Nuclear weapons don't keep us safe. They threaten massive and discriminate harm to millions of people. Some might like to say that uh, their nuclear weapons won't ever be used, that they are just for deterrence. But nuclear deterrence theory relies on a credible threat of use. So they are designed and deployed to be used on a uh, hair trigger alert, as David said. There are at least 1,000 nuclear weapons currently deployed on high alert. Now, this all, the, for this system to work, it presumes that there is no risk of nuclear accidents, and there have been many close calls and near misses that are known about to date, and there are likely many more. The non-use of nuclear weapons to date is also, you know, partly down to just good luck. And, you know, can we afford to rely on good luck to avoid uh, millions of deaths from uh, a nuclear, um, nuclear weapons detonation? Good luck doesn't last forever. Uh, the risk of nuclear weapons use, um, either deliberately, by accident, or miscalculation, is real and could happen at any time. And it's worth thinking about with uh, artificial intelligence and cyber, um, the cyber vulnerabilities of the uh, nuclear command and control systems, uh, that there is uh, a growing risk of um, um, them being hacked and, and attacked, and which could lead to, to, uh, to accidental use. As Ireland noted when it joined the treaty, there can be no right hands for the wrong weapons. Uh, some might argue that a nuclear ban treaty is ineffective and dangerous and won't actually achieve anything without the nuclear armed states having joined it. And it's true, all the, nuclear, all the states' parties to the treaty at present are non-nuclear weapon states. But if the treaty is so ineffective, why are they criticising it? Why did the US tell its NATO allies that the treaty could and is designed by ban advocates to destroy the basis for US nuclear extended deterrence? If it's so ineffectual, why did they call on signatories to withdraw their instrument of signature or ratification before the treaty entered into force? They didn't bother uh, approaching New Zealand uh, in, that, um, in that case. So there's a lot of diplomatic gymnastics going on. States claim that the treaty will delegitimise extended deterrence, and yet they claim support for disarmament, on the other hand. In fact, the TPNW delegitimises and stigmatises nuclear weapons and makes nuclear disarmament a global humanitarian responsibility shared by all states, rather than just the exclusive nuclear weapons club. Some might say that the TPNW conflicts with and undermines the NPT, that's just plain false, it doesn't. There is a lot of legal analysis showing that it in fact reinforces and supports the NPT and expands upon it by, by banning nuclear weapons themselves and not just their proliferation. It actually supports the disarmament requirements of the NPT 
So what happens now? Well, the TPNW states' parties will continue to advocate for universality and encourage and support other states to join. And as I said, New Zealand is doing this in the Pacific. Um, it will create uh, an opportunity for discussion to tease out the arguments of the non-nuclear weapon states that remain opposed to the treaty, um, who are currently playing diplomatic gymnastics. They oppose the treaty and yet they support uh, disarmament. So they will have to really justify their position as to why they continue to rely on uh, inhumane weapons um, that they don't even own as part of their security. Uh, we will see the TPNW states parties uh, submit their declarations about any involvement in nuclear weapons to date. So far, so good. We will see the first meeting of states parties, which could be expected to uh, elaborate the verification provisions, working on uh, designating a competent international authority for the treaty verification system, uh, and education is key in that regard. Uh, we might see other states uh, become observers to the treaty, uh, even if they haven't yet joined, and I believe Sweden is uh, keen to, to become an observer to the treaty, so that would be very welcomed. We will continue to see uh, heavy civil society involvement in the treaty, as with other uh, convention, as with the conventional weapons treaties that the civil society movements are involved in. We will continue to see civil society monitoring states' compliance with this treaty. We've already seen, uh, I believe, two editions of the Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor come out, and it's a really useful resource on the state of um, on states' positions on the treaty, on their um, adherence to their uh, the obligations under the treaty and it's a, a really good resource, especially for students, so I encourage everyone to have a look at that. Um, there are some key states to watch coming going forward. Um, one of them, uh, our dear neighbour and cousins, uh, Australia. Now, Australia is, is somewhat opposed to the treaty, has been playing um, diplomatic uh, gymnastics in their statements, tying themselves in knots. I mean, it's, it's amusing to watch, but it would be... Um, um, perhaps more interesting to see them get actually involved in the in the discourse rather than just boycotting um, the events. Uh, there was a 2018 survey in Australia that showed that 80% of people there support Australia joining the treaty. There's been cross-party support by parliamentarians to join the treaty, and in fact the Australian Labor Party um, made a commitment in 2018 that uh, if, if they win the election that they will join the treaty, subject to some conditions that might give them a way out, but it's still an encouraging uh, thing to to see there. Uh, in Belgium, uh, which hosts US nuclear weapons in Europe, they have 20 gravity bombs on their territory. There was a recent vote on whether to remove those US nuclear weapons, and it, just a few days ago, that uh, vote fell by a slim margin, 74 to 66. But a public opinion poll there um, shows that 64% of the Belgian population uh, want them to join the TPNW, despite their NATO uh, um, alliance. Um, and in fact, being in, a NATO, in the NATO alliance is actually no legal impediment impediment to joining the TPNW, no matter what the US might say. Uh, we've seen debate in the German parliament, um, where some are also calling for the removal of US nuclear weapons there, and it's interesting the debate was actually triggered over the uh, budget decision um, to spend um, money to purchase new aircraft for delivering those US nuclear weapons. The US is also uh, looking to modernise the nuclear weapons that are in Germany, so it's a very live debate in Germany. And, of course, we will see the MPT Review Conference in August 2021 20, this year, which will um, be dealing with the uh, TPNW um, as a, a legal treaty and not just a concept for the first time. So there are some very interesting uh, developments to be watching out for with this treaty in the near future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming here and being here in this day. I'm sorry if, if I'm using my phone, I'm not on Tinder or anything. I've just got my PowerPoint here and trying to walk you through it. Uh, my, my talk here actually builds on what David actually pointed out, that insecurity leads to armament. And I will, here I will try to talk to you about why uh, uh, it's warming up, I think. Yeah. Okay. And I, I would like to talk to you why Iran feels insecure, uh, 
And a lot of people told me that uh, after listening to me for 10, 15 minutes, are you actually advocating for Iran to get bombs or are you here to talk about non-proliferation? But I will actually explain why I think it's critical that Iran not build bombs and how we can actually get them to not do so. So what we've seen is that uh, the P5 are not giving away their bombs anytime in the future. And now we kind of have an unofficial P4 that uh, Angela named, Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And North Korea and Iran uh, had very similar situations maybe 20 years ago. And Iran is one of those threshold states that is currently standing on, on, a, on a very thin line and could be pushed to the nuclear side, or if the JCPOA is reinstated, could actually step back from the nuclear side and and stop us from having an unofficial P5 of, of nuclear armed states. So why does Iran feel insecure? If you've had a look at the map of US bases in the Middle East, uh, I've got one here, uh, there are US bases in Qatar, in Bahrain, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the US military was present in Afghanistan, in Iraq, it used to be in Central Asia at some point, and it's in Incirlik in Turkey. And if you actually plot all those uh, locations on a map, you will see that, oh, they, they accidentally circle a country called Iran. It's Iran, not Iran, so that's another issue. So you have this country surrounded by U.S. military bases. And, but it's not just U.S. military bases. Iran is, uh, is surrounded by countries that have access to top-notch military and conventional uh, arms. Uh, in in 2016, Saudi Arabia spent close to $76 billion on acquiring uh, conventional military technology. In that year, it outspent India and Russia. And those are much more bigger countries with more uh, security issues than Saudi Arabia. You also have uh, the United Arab Emirates, which no one apparently has any official numbers, but they spend close to $25 billion every year on their military. You also have the Israelis, which spend immensely on their uh, conventional military and also get a bunch of uh, Christmas uh, military present from the White House every year in, in military aid. And on the other side, you have Iran spending close to 10 to $12 billion on its military. And it's not just numbers, it's actually technology. Recently, Iran celebrated the 50th birthday of some of its F-4 Phantoms. So that's a 50-year-old uh, military aircraft. I mean, I've seen 50-year-old cars, and I'd rather not travel with them anyway, but imagine sitting in a 50-year-old piece of junk flying up in the air. And the last time Iran actually got access to anything new, uh, in a, for example, in Air Force, since was actually in the 1990s, which is still 30 years, 31 years ago. And it's uh, on the ground, it's military, it's, it's using tanks that were outdated when the Persian Gulf in, in the 1990s was around. Their navy are really good at shooting each other out. Each other out. Recently, uh, during a missile maneuver, they accidentally took out one of their other ships. So they don't have a really good track record in that sense. So this country is, is surrounded by hostile nations by outside powers, and it has a very weak military conventional power, but uh, they're not daft. <laughs> there are some areas which they're pretty good at, and one of them is, is ballistic missiles. And this is one of their areas that has kind of built them some conventional deterrence, and the good thing for them is ballistic missiles are actually pretty difficult to defend against. Uh, a whole battery of Patriot PAC-3 costs around two, two and a half billion dollars, give or take. Uh, and it can defend against maybe a salvo of 20 ballistic missiles, but 20 ballistic missiles perhaps only cost $500 million. So by spending another $500 million, you have to force the other side to spend another two and a half billion to get another PAC-3. So it's, a, it's quite a credible threat. And they have their whole network of proxies, which everyone tells you, but also everybody else in the Middle East has that proxy network as well. And nowadays, one thing that is really dangerous, I think, for security and actually will work against the, the TPNW is, is some European states asking for Iran to get rid of its ballistic missiles. Again, you have this country that is insecure in a more classical physical sense, and its only credible 
source of kinetic, physical, military power are its ballistic missiles, and you are asking them to give it away so everybody else feels safe. Feels safe. Who is everybody else? Those countries that are spending $80 billion every year on their, on their military. And, and so you might start seeing reasons that why people in Tehran might be cooking up some nukes in the undergrounds in Fordo or, or some of their other, other nuclear sites. And uh, the JCPOA was, was, very, uh, was very good, as Angela pointed out, in, in advocating for non-proliferation, for stopping Iran from stepping over this line and making those unofficial P4 or P5. And, and it, was, it was very important. Iran agreed to implementing the, the additional protocol, so that's extra IAEA verification. IAEA has always said that Iran has stood up by its, uh, by its obligations, uh, but unfortunately we had uh, the genius in the White House coming in and, and leaving the JCPOA in hope of its maximum pressure working to get Iran to do what it wants. Now, a lot of people say Iran does a lot of bad things, which I totally agree with. So does everybody else in the Middle East. But uh, I would like to quote uh, Dr. Ali Voez, who's who works on the Iran desk at the International Crisis Group, the same International Crisis Group whose head, Rob Mali, was uh, appointed as uh, President Biden's Iran envoy, that says, the JCPOA wasn't a cure-all for Iran's adversarial relationship with the US and, to a lesser extent, to a lesser extent Europe. But in delivering a strong non-proliferation agreement, it addressed a core global concern, and it can do so again. So it's very critical uh, that states that are pro TPNW and do not want another proliferator exiting and going and becoming nuclear armed to support uh, for the United States coming back to the JCPOA so that you know uh, we do not have an Iran that feels uh, kind of cornered, a cat cornered in a, in, a, in a corner never gives away, it usually attacks you and tries to get away and, and this is what's going to happen if, if countries start putting too much pressure on Iran, saying that, okay, we are leaving the JCPOA, we are sanctioning you, and you should actually give away your ballistic missiles, your only credible source of defense, so that we can, give, we can let you breathe, then it's a very dangerous situation, because Iran would perhaps go the same path as North Korea. Nowadays, North Korea has fission bombs, has fusion bombs, and are now talking about uh, theater level, uh, ballistic, uh, theater, theater grade, and nuclear weapons. So not just strategic, not Los Angeles, actually hitting the, uh, the DMZ, where you know South Korean troops might be coming, which is, a, which is, which is very dangerous. And it's, it's very important that, you know, to stop uh, Iran from, again, uh, threshing the, uh, crossing the threshold, that states come together and, uh, and facilitate Iran and the US talking and the reinstallment of the JCPOA. And, and I think this, it's very critical for not just global security, but also regional security in the Middle East, because as David mentioned, uh, nuclear proliferation is a bit of a chain. If Iran gets the bomb, then Saudi Arabia wants it, then the UAE wants it, then Turkey wants it, and then Egypt wants it, and then uh, instead of a nuclear-free Middle East, we're gonna have the, everybody has a nuclear bomb Middle East, which is uh, something really ugly, and I hope we never see it. Thank you very much. like to um, thank our fantastic speakers um, for a really enlightening um, discussion today about um, this, you know, sort of long history um, topic, um, but it's still relevant um, for all of us, and, um, and I think you've all kind of um, helped enlighten that for, um, for me particularly, but I'm sure for most of the audience as well. So audience, um, with me, please thank um, our speakers uh, for their contributions tonight. Um, as you've seen, we've um, recorded tonight's um, event and we'll put that up onto our YouTube channel so that you can actually um, watch it or um, send links to, um, to friends and colleagues. Um, so that will be up there in the next few days. Um, but thank you all once again for um, coming tonight and thank you audience for being here. Thanks.